a reflection for the feast of Christ the King. Praise be Jesus Christ now and forever. From today's Gospel. At that time Pilate said to Jesus, Art thou King of the Jews? Kingship has suddenly become rather topical. We're getting used to referring to King Charles after the dramatic and swiftly unfolding events of last month. But what else will be changed? There's a change of prayer at the end of the sung mass on Sundays. Instead of Domine Salvum Fac Regina Nostra Elizabeth for the last, yes, 70 years, we now need to get used to Domine Salvum Fac Regem Nostrum Carolum. We're thinking forward to the coronation of King Charles on May the 6th next year. What will be different from last time? Not many of us, of course, can remember that, but there is a sort of, well, national memory. When will we have new stamps and new notes? But surely there's more to it than this. Thomas Macaulay defined the constitutional monarch as a sovereign who reigns but does not rule. And he died in 1859. So that's a long time for that sort of mentality, that sort of definition. That's what we have, a sovereign who reigns but does not rule. Don't be fooled by the term constitutional constitutional monarchy, however, some constitutions are unwritten. We believe in a rex justus, a righteous king, a monarch whose power stems mainly from his great piety as well as from his princely vigour. And it's still something devoutly to be wished in the human sphere but real kingly power has been on the decline for a very long time. Perhaps the execution of Charles I in 1649 was a significant date in that. George III certainly meddled in matters. For instance, he tried to stop Catholic emancipation in this country. And there's a man who lost the American colonies in 1783. Catholic emancipation was only achieved in 1829. But the last prime minister to be fired by the monarch, well, that happened before Queen Victoria. What we expect is a figurehead today, someone who can influence others by example, by words, and by other indirect means, perhaps draw us together in the crises which will inevitably come and there is some intangible sense of tradition this is what we do we felt it at the funeral of the late queen it's part of belonging but there's that fight that polite fiction that parliament takes its authority from above especially at moments of great importance like the change of leader Four days ago, King Charles asked the Right Honourable Rishi Sunak to form an administration. This is what Queen Elizabeth had done with Ms. Truss fewer than two months ago. It's what we do. But everybody knows that it was the Conservative Party and Conservative MPs respectively who voted for them as leader and therefore put them there. If we want something done, we lobby our MP rather than courtiers of the king. Legislation is in the hands of elected representatives. How does that compare with Christ's kingship? Sometimes I think that our monarchy is how we think and act in regard to Christ, a figurehead while we get on with the real job. That's the way we view tradition too, isn't it? 
nostalgia, wishful thinking, something that's gone. Our Lord certainly had tradition behind him, the Old Testament kings. King David at the top, he, our Lord, was King David's greater son. By the time of the Roman occupation, that kingship was rather battered, compromised. Despite the best efforts of the Maccabees, not long before the birth of Christ, but the leaders thought they knew what they wanted. A temporal king. Christ didn't fit. If you remember, they got Saul the first time they wanted a temporal king. At the cross, the Jews demanded that Pilate change the sign above Christ, which proclaimed Jesus of Nazareth the king of the Jews. They wanted it to read, says he is. That was important to them. And they lost. Pilate said, I have written what I have written. The claim to be king, therefore, was much more powerful then than now. And indeed, it played a very important part in our Lord's trial. The church teaches that Christ has legislative power. He's no figurehead. Not just endorsing the politics of my government at any price. Luther denied that Christ could make law. He said that Christ was restricted to making promises. But Christ does make laws. In Luke 12 we read, You have heard that it was said to them of old, Thou shalt not king kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whosoever is angry with his brother shall be in danger of the judgment. There is our Lord laying down something very important. And he brings in, of course, a law of love. And Jesus answered, the first commandment of all is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart, and with thy whole soul, and with thy whole mind, and with thy whole strength. This is the first commandment, and the second is like to it. Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. There is no other commandment greater than these. There is our Lord, if you like, laying down the law. We read in Quas Primas, which Pope Pius XI wrote in order to establish this feast in 1925, we read this. It's long been the common custom to give Christ the metaphorical title of king because of the high degree of perfection whereby he excels all creatures. He is very truth, and it is from him that truth must be obediently received by all mankind. He reigns too in the wills of men, for in him the human will was perfectly and entirely obedient to the holy will of God. And further, by his grace and inspiration, he so subjects our free will as to incite us to the most noble endeavours. He is king of hearts, too, by reason of his charity, which exceedeth all knowledge. There we have it. Truth, will, and charity. What do we make of the reply Jesus gives to Pilate at the trial to the question, Are you a king? In John 18 we read, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would certainly strive that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not hence. Does that suggest a weak kingdom? Does that suggest a figurehead? Well, kings have power over us. Sin, our sin, has power over us if we let it. We are in a battle. We are 
we have to take sides for Christ or for the devil. So to say the kingdom, Christ's kingdom is not of this world is not to say that it is otherworldly. Christ's kingdom is all the more real. For we are not contending against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the powers, against the world rulers of this present darkness, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Ephesians 6.12 for all our weakness and complacency. We have a king encouraging us to do battle. We have to listen to his call. We have to sign up. We have to fall into line behind the one who loves us and the one whom we love. Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, that I should give testimony to the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. So today, let's say it loud. Christ is our King. Praise be Jesus Christ, now and forever.